Live from Dallas-Fort Worth, this is WFAA News. Welcome to WFAA Academy. I'm Cleo Green. For the next three weeks, we're going to bring you special lessons of the day. Today is Tuesday, so our daily topic is STEM. And today, meteorologist Jesse Huila is teaching us about the science behind meteorology. Hey, everybody. Meteorologist Jesse Huila here. And with the WFAA Academy talking about STEM, you know we're going to bring in one of the weather nerds to talk about the weather. So let's jump into it. Uh, this has been something that has fascinated me my entire life. Being a meteorologist is the only thing I've ever wanted to do because really stuff like this, this is a supercell thunderstorm from the top and the bottom. So you see, this is the anvil of a supercell. This is what you're underneath when we get all that very heavy rain, the hail, the lightning. And this is what the bottom looks like from the distance, maybe even a wall cloud there. We're going to talk all about this stuff here in just a moment, but what does someone like myself, a meteorologist, do on a daily basis? Well, we study the weather using models and tools. Start thinking of some weather tools for me. What might you think of? We'll talk about those in a second. We also prepare forecasts and weather casts that go on television in order to better prepare you and your families for the week ahead. We get to go out and talk to schools and visit teachers and students and talk about weather and weather safety. That's with our Weather Minds events. And then, of course, our most important thing that we do is inform residents about severe weather. Did you think of some weather tools? Because we're opening the weather toolbox. A thermometer. I think a lot of you have these at home or on your phones or in the cars. This just measures temperature. Pretty obvious, right? A rain gauge, we use those a lot. Those measure how much rain has fallen in an area. This can help us determine whether we're going into droughts or if we need to be concerned about flooding. What about this thing? What is that? Does anyone know? I'll give you two seconds. It measures pressure. It's a barometer. A barometer helps us measure atmospheric pressure. Lower pressure means bad weather is possible. Higher pressure means good weather. And we use wind vanes and anemometers, which I said wind vane, measures wind speed and wind direction. One of the other big important tools we use in order to collect weather data is something like this. This is a weather balloon. Our friends at the National Weather Service release these uh, several times a day all across the world. And I want you to see what's in her right hand. That right there is called a radio sonde. Don't worry, we'll see it again here in a second as the balloon takes flight. Uh, this thing can go 100,000 feet plus into the atmosphere, and it measures weather data. There it is right there. See it dangling there from the bottom of the balloon? That radio sonde has those tools on them. It measures temperature, wind speed, uh, pressure, all the way from the surface, way up into the higher parts of the atmosphere to areas like this. That's how high these weather balloons get. We need that data. We need the temperature, we need the wind speed and direction and the, the humidity all the way up into these levels of the atmosphere and able to forecast the weather better. So pretty stunning shot, right? We also use things like satellites too. Uh, satellites sit over the earth and they take pictures of the earth constantly. So when you see things on TV, when you're watching us do the weather, like the clouds, that's because a satellite sitting down and looking at the earth and scanning it and taking pictures like this. And this helps us better see things like tropical storms where thunderstorms may develop or even hurricanes. Oh boy, it's time for cloud types. This is one of my favorite things to talk about, and I hope that you get as excited about this as I do because it's pretty cool stuff. Okay, we're going to talk about our three basic cloud types. Number one is the puffy cloud. That is a cumulus cloud. Okay, our second main cloud type, thin wispy clouds spread across the sky. That is cirrus. Okay, what about this one? It's like a blanket across the sky. Stratus. Those are our three main cloud types. Cumulus, Cirrus, and Stratus. But we have some less common cloud types that I love looking at. Look at these. Sometimes we get these in North Texas. Um, a lot of moisture in the atmosphere with these. It's a type of stratus cloud. Try to say this after me, okay? Undulatus asperatus. Let's try again. Undulatus asperatus. Close enough. Look at these. You don't see these around North Texas. You'll see these around mountainous areas. Uh, some people say they look like the Wi-Fi signal uh, or spaceships. These are called lenticular clouds. 
This we would see in North Texas if we had some severe thunderstorms. This is kind of the textbook picture of what one of these looks like. It's a leading edge of a very strong thunderstorm and it's called a shelf cloud. Look at these. I think these are neat too. You know, when you time lapse these particular clouds, it looks like waves crashing into the beach. Uh, these are called Kelvin Helmholtz waves. And then my absolute favorite cloud, which I geek out over every time I see it, uh, these are on the underside of some really strong thunderstorms, and these are called Mamatis clouds, or Mamatis, tomato, tomato, Mamatis, mam whatever you want to say. A lot of people say they look like jellyfish or cotton balls. They're just so cool to look at. You know, weather events can be very stunning. Um, I've been a storm chaser for a long time, and these are some of the pictures I've taken. This is a supercell thunderstorm I was chasing in Kansas in 2018, a shelf cloud near Salina, Texas in 2017, and a wall cloud in Pilot Point in 2017 as well. We were watching for the development of a potential tornado there in the distance. You can see where that wall cloud and that rotation was. Something uh, vital for storm chasers. A little bit more about thunderstorms. You've heard us say severe thunderstorms before, right? Well, what makes a thunderstorm severe? Well, you have to have quarter size hail or larger, 60 mile per hour winds or higher, or a tornado. Any one of those three things would make a thunderstorm severe because sometimes those can cause damage. Now, this is really important. I want you to listen up. If you ever hear us say we have a severe thunderstorm watch, that means the ingredients are there for severe thunderstorms, but it's not happening right now. This is kind of a weird example, but it means we have the cookie dough. We have the flour, we have the, the eggs, the sugar. It's all there for cookies, but we don't have cookies yet. So we have to keep an eye out. Now, when the cookies have baked, that's when you have a warning. So the storm is happening right now. The ingredients have come together and we need to act immediately and get into our safe place. So a watch means the ingredients are there. A warning means it's happening. Tornado tidbits, just a really quick little bit of information. Less than 20% of severe thunderstorms produce tornadoes. They can stay on the ground for many minutes, maybe even miles. And most tornadoes move from southwest to northeast. And of course, Texas is in the middle of Tornado Alley, but Tornado Alley over the last several uh, several years or even several decades has kind of shifted a little bit. So parts of the Midwest, like Indiana and Illinois, and down into the deep south, like Mississippi and Alabama, are kind of the new Tornado Alley as well, because they see quite a bit of tornadoes. And there you go, you know what a tornado is, right? These are some really fascinating photos to see of wall clouds and tornadoes and water spouts, which is a tornado over water. And I also want to talk about lightning before we go, how it forms and how to be safe. Well, lightning forms because there's an electrical imbalance inside of a thunderstorm and it has to discharge all that electricity. And each year, lightning strikes the earth over 20 million times. You know, you can actually count how far a thunderstorm is or how far the lightning is away from you. When you see the lightning, start counting Mississippis. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. And then you divide that number by five, and that'll tell you how many miles the thunderstorm is away from you or that lightning strike is. Lightning is 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is crazy. I don't know if you know this or not, but that's five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Lightning is very, very hot. And this is something cool I want to show you before we go. Uh, a researcher named Tim Samaras took this camera that can record up to a million frames per second and can get these lightning strikes in extremely slow motion as they discharge from a thunderstorm. How cool is that? We're watching it again. Watch, top left of your screen, down to the bottom right, lightning being discharged. And once it reaches the surface, you finally see that big flash of light. So very cool. Now you're a weather expert, so solve this equation for me, will you? These are some of the equations that meteorologists use. I'm kidding, don't worry about it. Um, thank you for listening to our little weather lecture here. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.